moments in dear Pakistan. So anyway, that was, that's kind of how this whole thing came about. And the reason that happened was because this writer, who's written 24 volumes of short stories and 26 novels as well, historical fiction, <coughs> has never been translated in book length. This, this, what you're looking at right here, it's a historic milestone because A, it is the first book length translation of this writer, and B, it is the first Gujarati to English translation to be published in the US. And I'll tell you why the second part is so important, because Gujarati is the third most spoken language in the South Asian American diaspora. Okay, it's the third most spoken language. Hindi and Urdu come before that. And despite it being the third most spoken language in the South Asian American diaspora, we've never had a Gujarati to English translation. And the reason is we, have, we don't have a lot of literary translators from, the, from that language. I, can, I know of, I can count them all on the two, on, on, yeah, on my hands. I, I know them all. There's very few of us. Mm -hmm. We are a rare breed. And so, um, to, and, and um, the ones that are, are that do exist, at least two of them are academics and scholars, and they prefer to focus on certain classic writers as opposed to more of the writers that I would do. And so there is, even in India, there isn't a lot of um, knowledge or uh, appreciation for Gujarati literature because there just isn't enough being translated. There's a thing in India we call it the language pyramid, where some languages, and this, the, the language politics goes back to even ancient times, before colonial India, before, Brit before the British came, certain languages are translated more than others, like Bengali and Hindi. Um, and so they, and, and they're not just translated more into English, they're translated into other regional languages. Whereas, and in fact, a lot of these Gujarati writers, Dumgetu himself translated from Bengali into Gujarati. He translated Tagore, he translated Prince, he translated Kali Gibran. So we brought, you know, one of the, the scholars, the translators that I know, he, he's a great guy, he said, um, it's a typical Gujarati trait. So he says, we're very good at taking or bringing in wealth from other cultures, but we're not very good at sharing our wealth. And so, for me, this book is a way of sharing the wealth. It's me uh, sharing. Uh, it's me sharing and saying, "Hey, look, you know, first Gujarati to English translation. Here you go." And it's a classic writer. It's short stories. It's uh, my mother's favorite writer. So how can I not? You know. Um, but again, historically, he is very important in the Gujarati literary canon. And so I. I'm just glad I got the opportunity. So, with that, so I'll stop and I'll maybe just read a little bit. So, we have these two glasses. Um, that's for all getting older. Um, but um, one thing I'll say, you know, Dumkhetu was, um, he was writing during the time when India was going through um, the independence, uh, the freedom struggle for independence from the British. And there were, Various, I mean, Gandhi, who was the biggest political leader at the time, is Gujarati himself. Uh, Jinnah, who was the Pakistan Gujarati leader. Interesting, both Gandhi and Jinnah, both of them Gujarati, right? And you would have thought, given that these two very prominent uh, figures, political figures, in India at the time of this, uh, when, when this person was writing, um, well, they knew about him, of course, and they knew his contemporaries as well. But what happened was, Dumkhetu was one of those writers, he preferred his writing. His writing was his way of, his literary activism. His writing was his activism. He wasn't the one who would be on stage sloganeering. He wasn't that kind of person. His writing spoke. And so a lot of these stories are political. Um, they talk to caste and class and gender discrimination and sexism. He was ahead of his time. He wrote about sexism in, um, Indian society at a time, especially in conservative Gujarati society, that people didn't talk about these things. They're not in mixed company, for sure. And so he wrote about these things. Um, versus some of his contemporaries, like K. M. Munshi, were nationalists. And they were out there, they were writing their books, but they were out there rallying, and their books were out there as messages. And, you know, 
Hill, whereas he was focused on the aesthetics and literary art form, but at the same time making sure, yes, there is a message, but I'm not going to let the message drown the art, and I want to balance the art and the message. And so that was something very different about him as well. Um, anyways, so with that, um, let me, you know, I, I get asked a lot about um, which is my favorite story. <laughs> and that's hard. There's 24 stories in here. There was supposed to be one more, which I just, for whatever reason, I translated it and I forgot to send it to my publisher as part of the MS. <laughs> and so that got published as a journal separately. Um, and that one is about Hindu Muslim challenges. Uh, which again, at that time, very few people were writing about, but he did, he wrote about it. Um, he, it was a story actually about um, the Muslim immigrants who had come from Sindh, um, the Sumra tribe, and come and settled in a rural village, a Hindu village in Gujarat, and how they were treated and how they were eventually driven away. And that happens a lot. But if you read that story, the themes, the immigrant themes, how immigrant alienation, how an immigrant feels in a, a, an alien environment. I think most immigrants reading that book today would identify with that. They would know what that means, what that feels like. So I'm just, when I say some of the themes are timeless, um, that's what I mean. Um, so coming back to favorite stories, there's one story in here which is the only story people who know Dhumketu in India will say, oh yeah, I know the post office. And it is not one of my favorite stories. And, the, and despite that, I had to put it in here because the editor said, oh, well, it's the most anthologized, so you have to you have to have it here. The only reason it's not one of my favorite stories is a bit sentimental. It's about a father who's missing his daughter. It's beautifully written. Um, I just feel like it ended in a very sad way, so I didn't like it very much. But um, my favorite story in here is actually, uh, at least as of today, right at this moment, is um, a historical story. Uh, and Dunketu was actually also known for his historical fiction. He did a lot of research. He would actually make sure that his historical fiction was very accurate to the, you know, and, and make sure that he had the facts straight. This story is in medieval India. It's um, a courtesan in one of the medieval kingdoms called Amrapali. She's very famous in India because there's been like tons of movies that have been made about her, um, beautiful movies. Um, various people in various languages have written novels about her as well, so he's not the first. But what I, the reason I included, that's the only historical fiction I have here, the reason I included that story, he was so taken with Amrapati that after writing the short story, he wrote a whole novel about her as well. She was this amazing character. She was, a and his portrayal of her is not just as this uh, beautiful femme fatale. His portrayal of her is as this very shrewd, very intelligent, politically savvy woman who knew how to deal with men in power. And so he wrote about her in that way, which is again not often that you would see that in the movie versions. You don't get to see that side of her. You get to see the seductress and the beautiful woman dancing and singing and you know all of that. Whereas here, he shows how she's very sad and she understands um, the, the politics between the kingdoms and you know how to deal with it. So, anyways, but the, the, the part that I'll read, uh, it's a short story, so it doesn't have all of that in here. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's go and find that. Tears of the Soul. Um, you know, one other thing I was saying to Riley as I was. Uh, talking earlier was the stories are a hundred years old. Some of them are written in a certain Gujarati dialect that I don't speak today. And the sentences, Gujarati uh, in the at that time you'd have these long run-on sentences like clause after clause after clause. <laughs> and what I literally had to do was I would do the literal translation in English and then I would have to spend like an hour with one sentence just <laughs> arranging and rearranging it. Like how do I make this work in English? It's not easy. Um, and even now, sometimes I'll read and I'll go, oh, I wish I'd done that differently. <laughs> so a translation is never done. You're always, you know, you're doing it. Okay, Tears of the Soul. Um, so a uh, little context. The kingdom is called Vaishali, and it 
in those times, it was very different because it had a republican democracy. It didn't just have this um, you know, autocratic or dictator-like king and a kingdom. Uh, it was a republican democracy, so they had a town hall, and they had um, people who would make decisions as a committee. And so it was very unique and revolutionary, even for its time, um, that they had that kind of democracy. So, OK. Um, there was considerable chaos in Vaishali's town hall today. Many elderly statesmen had sat themselves on the clean marble steps of the town hall. Many were in the open field, holding their chariot reins, listening to the uproar inside. Holding massive spears in their hands, many young men were strolling about as they liked. There was disorder in the assembly. It was as if no one was listening to anyone. Everyone talked however they liked. Just then, a chariot was seen coming from the bazaar ahead, craning their necks with eagerness and curiosity to know who was coming. Everyone began to get impatient. In a short while, the chariot came close. It is Muhammad, one youth yelled out. Hearing that, many young men left the steps of the town hall for the field and stood right in the path of Muhammad's chariot. It looks like Muhammad has arrived alone. So, then Amrapali has not come? All the young men babbled together. One of them stamped his foot in anger and thrust his spear into the ground. So then, she intends to disobey royalty and the law. They stepped aside a little to give way to a beautiful rider. From another direction, a couple of horsemen arrived. They were dressed as hunters. Dogs with smooth, glossy, and shiny coats were running to and fro around their horses. In the meantime, Mahanman got down from his chariot, climbed the smooth marble steps, and stood in the royal temple. As if a magic wand had been waved, the excited crowd became completely quiet. Everyone was curious to hear what Mahanman had to say. Noble folks, my adopted daughter, Amrapali, his voice faltered a bit. He cleared his throat and went on. Amrapali, whom you have disallowed marriage, because she was a daughter, per the Lichabi clan laws, and whom I have kept unmarried, so that the Lichabis, the Lichabi is one of the clans there, do not slice each other dead amongst themselves. People got impatient. Now, Dumpli the Wood was one of those writers, he liked to put footnotes. I had to keep his footnotes. These are not my footnotes. I will share the footnote he has here, <laughs> which is in Vaishali, and the reason I mention this, uh, in the translation world, footnotes are controversial. Mm. There, there are people who will say, as a translator, you should never have any footnotes, and some will say you should. I say it's the author put the footnote on the translation. Right. In Vaishali, the Republican state had a rule that any extremely beautiful woman should remain unmarried to entertain the men of the city. A rich man named Mahanman had a daughter named Amrapali, and due to her beauty, if she married anyone, the youth of Vaishali would compete amongst themselves and get sliced to death. So that's what he's talking about, Mahanman is saying that her daughter you know, can't marry her. Um, and then Singh Nayak, which is uh, the name of the uh, president of this administrative general assembly of this Republican democracy, he knew that this would be a problem, and so he was trying to resolve it, and that's why they were meeting. And that's the author's footnote. Um, so people got impatient to hear the end. And then Mahanman, the, the father, says, there has been no trace of her for eight days. Treason and insult to the assembly, uh, utterly false talk, many shouted. Mahanman, as if he could not hear the murmurs and the shouts, continued speaking. No trace. And though there was no trace, today she herself has suddenly arrived. So people heaved a breath of relief. Many called with joy. 
just then, there was a hubbub in the middle of the field. A majestic horseback rider could be seen cutting a path through the crowd. Folding both hands, citizens in all four directions were greeting him. But there, the Nayak, Nayak is a soldier, or in this case, he's the president of the assembly. The Nayak is arriving. He will tell you everything. People looked toward the open field with curiosity. The rider had descended from the horse and placed a foot on the steps of the royal temple. Settling his horse beside a sentry, he moved forward. Jai Vaishali, Jai Lichibi clan, Jai Sinai, triumphant cries, those are like, Jai means victory, victory too. Uh, triumphant cries rose immediately from the crowd. Laughing softly, keeping his hands folded before the masses, he continued climbing the steps with a careful agility. When he entered the royal temple, the lords stood and paid their respects. He went and sat beside Mahanaman. If anyone had dropped even a pebble, it would have been heard. Such was the deep silence among the congregation. The people were now restless to hear what Sinaiq would say. Sinaiq stood. He threw a fleeting glance at the people. It seemed as if, confronted by the majesty of this man, the entire crowd had grown smaller. Softly, but in a clear voice, he began speaking. Noble people, I have come to you only after Amrapali agreed to come here from Neil Padma Bhavan. If the General Assembly strongly desires to abide by Vaishali's law to the letter, they will have to accept whatever stipulations Amrapali puts forward. That's all right, that's all right. What are the stipulations? Tell us, this is the crowd. Amrapali says that her house will be considered a secure fort. No one will be allowed inside it without her permission. And her main work will be to please the masses with music. Uh, that stipulation is all right, many said. The statesman noblemen and people's representatives sitting in the royal temple said only, that is fine, and signaled the Nayak to inform them of the other stipulations. The General Assembly will have to give her a beautiful palace to live in Pushpa Bihar, uh, Sakta Bhumika Palace, which is, it's like an ancient Indian architecture thing that is very ornately designed. Many among the General Assembly glanced at each other now, it's now the demands are getting, you know, they're sort of escalating. Um, the third condition is that there will be no searching or checking of who's coming and who's exiting from Amrapali's home. With this, the General Assembly began to hum with voices. The faces of several elderly statesmen turned red like heated copper plates with anger. Many Navkoti Narayans, now he explains this, uh, Munkit. Navkoti Narayan is the word used to denote a karodhati, or the owner of a karod rupees, so million, millions and millions of rupees. Um, and Navkoti Narayan, literal meaning, is the owner of nine karods. Um, and so very rich people, very powerful people, knitted their brows. One of the princes of the state sat up erect and said out loud, that would be an insult of the General Assembly's authority. But before all those displays of consternation could play out fully, everyone's eyes turned and fixated on the steps of the royal temple. Wrapped in clothes as white as moonlight, a woman's person could be seen there. There was a huge uproar brewing in the field, and people were pushing and shoving to come forward. Many young men were clearing their paths by threatening people with their spears. The woman entered the town hall. In a short while, a silence spread all over again. She gathered up the ends of her fine, silky garments and looked at the General Assembly in a manner of issuing orders. Her small nose was flaring with pride, and her brows were raised with anger and disdain. Many were rankled by this look and the insult to the Republic's authority contained within it. But her charming beauty, like a poison-filled arrow, pierced their hearts. 
noblemen, and Brahmins. There was clear scorn in her words. The evil law that you are preserving in Vaishali, so it's the law where beautiful women cannot marry and have to entertain the masses. Evil, an insult of the law, said someone in the assembly. Yes, she emphasized. That evil law that you are preserving, I accept it if you agree to my stipulations. Otherwise, I will say no to being subjected to the authority of the General Assembly. God has given me beauty so that I do not have to subject to any earthly authority. Hmm. <laughs> if only. She stood, her body tall and her head held high, while she adjusted the string of pearls that adorned her head. A storm cloud seemed to gather. Amrapali's words sent a bolt of lightning through the General Assembly. The rule that visitors to Amrapali's house couldn't be inspected rankled many. Let's not stop there. <laughs> So you had a lot of these cultures in India, and it was just this huge sudden version. Plus, you know, you had a lot of Western literature that started to get translated, mm -hmm. and so there were those influences as well. You know, they, like I said, he, he, he's written, I translated his introduction here, and he refers to Conrad, and, yeah. and you know, Gorky, and Chekhov, and all these writers, you know. Um, so I think it was a very fruitful time in terms of production of literature. Um, because India was finally feeling like, okay, we're, we're going to be independent, we're going to do whatever we want, um, we're not subject to the British. But at the same time, um, I think it, they were certainly looking to the West in terms of literary aesthetics, mm. but they were writing about local issues, right? They were like writing about the problems that, sadly, in, a lot of cases still exist today because the things that Dunkeke wrote about were caste discrimination, class, sexism, um, and um, uh, you know a lot of that still goes on in India. You know, it's funny. I was, I think, I was telling uh, Stacy today was um, somebody put a Goodreads review. I don't go to Goodreads much at all, but today I, I got a message because they did something to combine the two editions, the Indian edition and this book. So I got some message. So I went to look. And somebody had just put a review in today and said, these stories are supposed to be 100 years old and they're supposed to be historic, but they read like they could just happen today in some yeah. rural village. And she wrote it, she meant it as a criticism. No. <laughs> but uh, I'm like, I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah, you know, I'll take that as a compliment because yes, these stories do read, if you oh. know Indian culture, some of these do read like they, ha they could happen today because rural India is still very much where it is now where it was then. So I do think 
that the society and the social issues that he has written about still represent um, India today for any reader who might be reading. And I also think, as I mentioned with the earlier story about the, the Muslim you know, tribal uh, family that had immigrated the Sumrao tribe from Sindh to Gujarat and how they were treated, um, my goodness, if, if anyone's following the news in India with what's going on with Hindu Muslim problems, especially in the state of Gujarat, that story would not be out of place if someone were to write it today. Uh, it's not like there's not a, a fun amount of sexism and yeah, classism right, going on yeah, right. also here yeah, in yeah. the present day. Um, uh, well, I was curious while you were talking why, it, what you said he, this writer has not been translated mm -hmm. into English in the same way, and then you mentioned that like an academic mm -hmm. understanding. Is this, you said your mother loved this writer. Right. Is this like, like, what, do moms love this writer? I guess this is my question. Is this like an every man's kind of writer? Like, is this a Stephen King? Um, I would say in, in the Gujarati culture, yeah. sure. Cool. Um, but so my mom, like, she never even got to finish her bachelor's degree. Uh, she was actually studying in literature, Gujarati literature, when, you know, this arranged marriage proposal came and she had to give up studying. Mm -hmm. and she'd get married and have kids. And so for her, reading was her escape. Family and everything. This was, the, you know, this was her escape. And so she loved to read. Um, she had gotten her reading habit from her father. So she, over time, she would get more and more of his books, and she would read, uh, read them. And she would tell us the stories. At least the ones that, I guess, she could tell us. You know, adapt them and read them when we were kids. And so we grew up knowing the name and knowing some of his stories. And I would say certainly her generation knows him very well. My generation and the one that has come after, they maybe know one or two of his short stories that get anthologized the most yeah. because they get to study as part of language art literature you know, in school. And so there's the post office which gets anthologized. It's also been translated into Hindi and possibly Hindi, I'm not sure. Um, and actually the post office gets compared a lot with another a Tagore story called uh, Kabulwala that some folks may know. Um, because in that, that's also about a father missing his daughter um, and then he ends up doing something drastic. And this is about Coachman Ali who also does, misses his daughter and ends up doing something drastic. And so you've got these two different um, men and they, people compare that a lot, the Tagore story with the Indian story. And so um, he's, he's known, uh, academically people know him. And there are papers out there, people that you know, they find entire theses written on the Gujarati short story and you know, must read Don't Get the Wind Twitter. But outside of academic circles, especially I would say because people don't even read as much Gujarati literature now. Yeah. You know, so there's just not enough people don't know it. And as I said earlier, there are I, I literally can count on my two hands the number of Gujarati to English translators. And within India, mm -hmm. like outside of the Gujarati language, is he read widely? No, because no. he's not being translated into other languages. Wow. Unlike, for example, Tagore, yeah. who's been, he was, like, he's known pan India because he's been, you know, Tagore wrote in Bengali, but he's been translated into all languages. Premchan wrote in Hindi Urdu, but he's been translated into all languages. Mm -hmm. Manto wrote in Hindi Urdu, but he's been translated into all languages. Dunkedu was not translated. And this is something I'm saying, well, this there's this one Gujarati to English uh, translator who's also a scholar, an act, a Gandhi scholar, an academic, Trudeep Saru. I interviewed him recently for Words Without Borders. And uh, I love what he said. He says, I asked him the same question. I said, why, why do you think that Dhumketu is not known outside of the Gujarati uh, world? And he said, um, the, the Gujarati literati, or the Gujarati culture, literary culture, were very good at bringing cultural wealth from other languages, other Indian languages, into Gujarat. So we translate a lot from other Indian languages. Mm -hmm. um, we have, you know, Bengali to Gujarati translators, Marathi to Gujarati translators. We have all these other Hindi to Gujarati translators. But he said, well, we're not very good at sharing our wealth. Mm -hmm. So we're not very good at translating our own literature into other languages. I don't know the reason for that. 
Well, I do actually. Um, <laughs> I do know the reason for that. Um, it's the language pyramid in India. Gujarati is the sixth most spoken South Asian language in, in South Asia. Okay. However, there is a language pyramid in India where certain languages, and there are all kinds of social reasons and, and political and capitalistic reasons, but publishers have preferred to publish translations from Bengali, Hindi, Urdu, Kannada, Tamil, and those languages before they even consider Gujarati. So the language politics, I would say, in India have also played a huge part in why PSR. May I add something to that? Yeah. Um, when the British arrived in the subcontinent, they set up a literary review. Mm -hmm. So they invited authors from various languages to share their literature, to write, mm -hmm. and create um, a library that could be then shared in England. And those writers were being translated widely. Tagore was one of them because yes. he actually, Tagore had a school for teaching Bengali yes. and all of the royal families from different provinces were sending their children to his summer school where they learned Bengali, even if Bengali was not their language. Mm -hmm. And because those authors and writers from those languages showed up, yes. they became a little more accessible. But someone, some, 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 some nationalism like Gujarati or even Urdu, where people were like, no to the British Raj, right. we're not going to. These people did not show up at conferences. They didn't yes. go to the meetings. They yes. weren't invited to the Savoy in London. So their literature kind of got shoved back and back and back. Yeah, and I think also there was this other thing where the British classified languages, and they would talk about Sanskrit. They love Sanskrit. Love Sanskrit. They, they love Sanskrit, especially the, the Europeans love Sanskrit, and they would translate yeah. from Sanskrit, right? And they would talk about Gujarati as being a, a derivative. Which is, that was it, which is not, it's which its own language, not. it has its own dialect, so, yeah. it but they, so there was this other thing which is part of the language politics, so certain languages were considered, like Bhojpuri, for example, is considered a derivative language. It's not, it has its own literary traditions, it's got millions of speakers, but when you have a colonizer come in and do this whole classification and say, oh, these are derivative languages, they're not as important, let's focus on, and, and they had that reason, they needed to focus on one or two main languages, so that they could learn one or two and get all the administrative work done through those one or two languages, right? So Hindi became the linked language. Bengali was a close second because for the reason that you said, but also the, there were a lot of Bengali people in the administrative positions. Yeah. Parsi and Bengali were two. Yeah. Parsi eventually, but Bengali more. Uh, and so because they Bengalis learned English more before other cultures because they were in administrative positions in Colombia. So they had to learn English. And so then there was more of that English to Bengali and Bengali to English translation. And then it just becomes like a continuous, or like yeah, a positive feedback loop over right, time. Right, exactly. Like that becomes, the for an English speaker, the, the writers that we know from any of the space are the ones who showed up, and then it becomes, yeah, okay, that's yeah. wild. And yeah. weird, the politics of translation. Yeah. Absolutely. So in a multilingual place like India, the politics are very complicated. Well, and then to like squish it all yeah. with the evil of colonialism. Yeah. Um, so sad, but wonderful that we're here now. Uh, I wanted to, speaking of politics and translation, which I was asking you about speak back earlier, so can we talk about this? Because in your introduction, which is beautiful, actually pivot, I, I know that many of these people might know you, many of them do not. How many languages do you speak? Oh. Well, so I was, yeah, I was mentioning this earlier. So I grew up in um, the state of Maharashtra, Bombay. And if you go to an English school in Bombay, you're going to learn the state language, which is Marathi. And I don't, I thought, did you grow up in Bombay? Yeah. So you, you grew up in Bombay too, so he, he, you probably learned Marathi. Hug me, right? Pardon? The, the Saman Rishdi's hug me. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And you Urdu, Marathi, Marathi. <laughs> yes, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So we, are, we had to learn the languages. We had to learn Hindi, the national language. We had to learn the state language. Each state had its own language. Mm -hmm. I learned Gujarati because it's my mother tongue. I spoke it at home. Um, Urdu, I, although I didn't officially learn it, yes, spoken Urdu I could totally understand because of Bollywood. <laughs> like Urdu. Urdu. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. And then my husband's Punjabi. And so I'm learning a little bit of that. <laughs> so. and, I, and you wrote a thesis in German? Oh yeah. Oh, oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, in another life, I studied engineering, and 
and um, that was in England. <laughs> and um, sure. part of my graduation required I, that I have a German and French component. And they made us take German and French for two years, as, along with the engineering. And I went and worked with Siemens in Berlin for six months, and I wrote my thesis in German. So. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. But I, my German's really bad now. <laughs> it's because it's been a long time. What well, language do you, because you also are a creative writer. Yeah. What well, language do you most prefer to write in? Oh, English. Okay. Because I grew up, yeah, I, you know, somebody, I try, okay, little secret, I tried translating one of my own stories into Gujarati, mm. and I am not going to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I would much rather, because somebody, my, my dad goes off to me, actually, he was like, I would love for my Gujarati friends to read your stories, and they can't read your English, so can you translate it? Oh. And so I thought, okay, you try it. No, it's tough. <laughs> The other way around. I can translate from Gujarati to English yeah. fine, but you know, I mean, I don't know how many of you know Jampa Lahiri, who now does Italian, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And she writes in Italian now. <laughs> yeah. But she will not translate her own Italian into good English. Uh, well, do you think it'd be more difficult to translate yourself? I think, it, yeah, I think, it, well, yes, for sure. It is more difficult. Um, I think her reasons, because I read her book recently, the, the essay collection translated myself. Oh, it's gorgeous. Her reasons are, it is gorgeous, but her reasons are a little different. Yeah. Um, because she used to write in English. Yeah. Now she writes in Italian. So you would think it would be easy for her to, you know, do that flip flop, you know, but she doesn't. And she said that she felt she was too close to it. Mm -hmm. And she felt like she would end up, end up writing a different book. Mm -hmm. And she didn't want to lose the integrity of the Italian. Mm -hmm. And so she'd like to translate it. And so I feel like, I, I do feel when I started to do that, when I started to translate my story into Gujarati, or well, the first thing I did was I started to cringe and think, oh my God, how awful is this story? Because in Gujarati, it doesn't sound at all like I want it to sound in English. Mm -hmm. You know, and then even though the story is set in Gujarati, I picked one that was set in Gujarati. Wow. And maybe I'm just too close to it, like, yeah. like she was saying, because I feel like, oh, this is not working, this is not working. And I think so if I tip that on as a project, it would just be a forever project. So it's <laughs> it's the infinite mirrors yeah, kind of situation. Right. Yeah. Um, also in your introduction, um, and everyone, by the way, we're we're gonna open it to Q and A very shortly, and then uh, you should all buy this book. Obviously, it's fabulous. You can finish the story she wrote out loud and the rest of them. Um, you call the reading, read, you refer to reading and writing, but specifically reading as translating, mm. um, which reminded me of one of my favorite. Quotes: the, the reading has a, is the most intimate. No, translating is the most intimate act of reading. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you talk on this a little bit? Yeah, I mean, Spivak said it. There's been a bunch of other people who said it. I think, you know, because when uh, you know, Lahiri said it recently in that essay collection as well. It is the most intimate form of reading because you are doing such close reading of the original text. Every single word and verb has to be translated and. Trust me when I say we agonize over a single verb and verb when we translate. Um, and so we're, even though, I mean, I write my own work, and obviously read and edit my own work, but when I'm translating, it's just a very deep and immersive kind of reading, because you're reading every word and every line. Mm -hmm. You are wondering about, initially, you're thinking about the author's choices. Because one of the things you want to try and do is bring across the author's voice and the author's rhythm. You're never going to be able to do that exact like for like from one language to another. There is no such thing as a perfect translation. You know, Jeffrey Zuckerman okay, keeps talking about that. Um, Daniel Searle, the great translator, who, I think he, translated, he translates from Brazilian languages, and he talks about that. So there is no such thing as a perfect translation, but I think. For me, when I started to translate, it changed how I read a text. Mm. With all texts? Text, all texts, yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. Even now when I read to do book reviews or I'm just reading for myself, I have become a much slower reader, which I don't <laughs> like. Because I used to be a much faster reader. But I've become a much slower reader because I read every word. <laughs> I do now. I can't just you know, skim like I used to when I before. You're chewing on it. Yes. Isn't that better? It's, it's, it's a better experience, for sure. It's a better experience. I do remember sentences more, and I can, like, when I'm doing the book review, and I can call it.
Well, I'm sure we're all better for it <laughs> to, to read this. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to questions for Jenny. Um, don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> it's okay if I asked all the questions. <laughs> but I know I did it. <laughs> yes. How long were you in the UK for? I was there for about seven years. Please don't film me. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I was there for about seven years. I, I only went there to do my engineering, um, and and I worked after I finished my engineering. I worked um, with a company there, and they transferred me to the U.S. on a work permit to do like, to continue a project here. So I was going to say you have a few terms of phrase that sound very British. I know. I think part of it is I went to a um, British boarding school in India as well. But then, of course, you know, once I was in the UK, yeah, pick up. I actually, th this is, I call this a mongrel accent. When I'm back in the UK or I'm talking to UK friends, the, the British comes out more. <laughs> so <laughs> this, I, this is more a mongrel accent right now. It tends to be the case with a lot of people from the UK, I know, where once they get back home, the accent goes uh, more, a lot more heavily in the UK when they're back home with, uh, with their family. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, it doesn't happen when I'm in India, though. Mm. And, and, and funnily enough, I remember when I went back to India after seven or eight years, and I met an old friend, and she thought that when I would start speaking again in Hindi with her, that it would come out with a British accent. But no, my Hindi is perfectly normal. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just it's just my English that changed. So yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, I was going to ask two questions, and I think she already did. What inspired you? to write this, and also um, how is his writing relevant to us? And I think he already did. Yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna ask you, your personal journey when you were writing this, what were the challenges, and how did that change you as an author and as a person? Oh, that's a great question. I, I will say this, every book, and, and you know, although I was a writer, I think every book changes you. Every book that you write changes you. Um, I, I, I say this a lot, Each of Us Killers, the first book that I wrote, I wrote that when I had gone back to India. Mm -hmm. That book could never have been written if I had been sitting in the US. Mm -hmm. That book happened because I happened to be sitting in 2014 in Gujarat, the year that the Chief Minister of Gujarat was elected Prime Minister of India. Mm -hmm. And because of all the things that were happening in the country at the time. Every story in that collection has a story behind it. Mm -hmm. So every, I, every story there changed me. It wasn't just one, the, the book itself, every single story changed me. Because you have to think that when you're gonna spend that much time with the characters when you're writing fiction, you really have to be committed and driven to write about that. And so every story I think when I'm writing changes me. Now, I, this is a quite related to what you just said. I, I've been asked this a lot, that did translating this author influence my writing? And I always say no. The reason, even though I've done a lot of close reading of Dumbeto, I cannot write like him. He was a 20th century writer, early 20th century writer. And while his themes are similar, his settings are very different. The people, the characters are very different. I'm writing about people today. I'm writing about people like me, um, who are multilingual, cosmopolitan, urban. Um, so no, I, I can't write like him. But I will say what you learn tricks of the trade when you translate, for sure. Uh, and Jampal Ayuri talks about this in her essay collection when translating Dominic Stano. You know, she she not only did she become a very close reader of him, but you know, she's translated three of his books. And she found certain things about his craft that, you know, so, and again, his craft is very different. He wrote, none of these stories are, well, there's maybe one story here that's a little bit experimental because it was more on the fantasy side, um, speculative, magical realism kind of story, but otherwise it's all social realism. So, um, and I write a lot of magical realism. So for me, um, there wasn't that much I could steal from him in terms of craft. But what I, what I, it was funny because when I first started reading him, even before I started translating him, I, I inherited my mom's um, books from him, his, and I started reading and I had these jolts of shock and recognition.
because I heard about some of these stories you know, from her. And for me, more than anything, this translation was about connecting deeper with my own language because it's a language I, I, I had that had kind of fallen into misuse for me a little. And, and you know, you guys will know how that feels, I've felt, and, and Marianne, and, you know, and, and you too, you know. Um, when you've grown up speaking a certain language, in, in the linguistic world, they call this thing subtractive multilingualism. Mm -hmm. What that means is that there are two things, is additive multilingualism and there's subtractive multilingualism. And subtractive multilingualism is when you become proficient in one language at the expense of another. So you are becoming proficient in English because that's the language you need to know to live in the world that you're in. But it is happening at the expense of another language. And so for me, translation was a way to uh, address that imbalance, I guess, in my life. It was a way for me to reconnect with my culture and with my language. It brought me closer back to home. Thank you. I have a question. Is there an idiom or expression that you had trouble translating into English? Oh, there's so many of them, actually. <laughs> well, I, you know, it's funny because, there are, again, this is a very divided, controversial topic in the translator world. There are some translators who will tell you nothing is untranslatable. Right. You just have to find, instead of a word, it might be a phrase, but you're going to find something. And there are some translators who will say nothing is fully translatable. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as a perfect translation. So for me, there were quite a few, and I wish I could remember off the top of my head uh, which one or two, um, but I think, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head which one or two, but I'll, I'll give you one example, like, you know, in the Gujarati language, there are at least 12 or more words for rain. Mm -hmm. um, and you cannot translate every single one of them into English, because there just aren't enough words in English for rain. And so when I'm trying to describe a particular type of rain that he's used the word for into English, I have to resort to rain. <laughs> and yeah. it doesn't mean what he meant, you know? So yeah. I, I have the same experience when I'm reading Tagore yeah. in Bengali. And mm. then I'm trying reading the English version. It's not the same. It's not the same. Not the same. So so that, you know, so there's a related question people ask me, and people say, well, why should I read in translation? You know, if I can read the original, I'll read the original. And if I can't read the original, I don't want to read the translation because it comes a distant second. Yes. You know, it's never going to be the same experience. And I say, because they say, oh, there's always something lost in translation. And I say, well, think about how much is found yes. in translation. Yes. Because, I mean, really, I'm quoting right? you. I'm going to quote you. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I, I'm stealing that from someone. I'm not going to say I don't remember who said it, but... Think about how much is found in translation, you know, yeah. because we're we're getting access to a whole different world, a whole different way of thinking, a different literary tradition. You know, the one thing that makes me really sad when I um, look at Gujarati writers who've never been read outside of Gujarat and who are even now not being read in Gujarat because Gujarat is becoming more anglicized and everything. And I think about how a lot of the different diverse literary traditions have gone by the wayside because now it's all the dominant Western literary tradition. We all write in a particular way. I wouldn't say an MFA way because I'm not an MFA. Uh, I don't think you are either myself. But but there is a certain acceptable way that Western publishers want, which you know, okay, we are all writing to that because we want to get published. But there are literary traditions that got uh, forgotten and didn't evolve as, as the Western one was allowed to evolve. The writers that you mentioned, you know, mm -hmm. from, from uh, Emily Dickinson's time, that was Hawthorne and all yeah. of them, you know, the, those Concord sages, all of them, Emerson and everyone. You know, they, their traditions have evolved. You can actually trace back um, writers who are writing, contemporary writers who are writing today, American writers, and you can trace the lineage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm the journey writer. You could not trace my literary lineage from my book to Dumpik. <laughs> you couldn't. No. Yeah. But that's a sad thing because yeah. that tradition, some of the things he had done there, didn't get to evolve, didn't get to progress and become something more. Well, this part of that's like a lack of, build, of like readership. Like right. Because like, my favorite part of reading 
and also is that like I feel like it's all in conversation with each yes. other. Yeah. And if we're not reading each other, you can't be in the conversation. Yeah. And, and he has a story about that in here because he was he loved the Gujarati language. He felt that even the Gujarati literati at the time when he was writing weren't making the maximum use of the beauty of the language. Mm -hmm. And he has a story in here where he talks about, I mean, the, the character, the, the narrator character is actually slamming the urban young Gujarati uh, men and women who are chasing, um, you know, are trying to learn the English language because that's how they're going to get good paying jobs. Because that's what you had to do in India. You had to learn the language so you could get the jobs. And so he is, in that story, the narrator is criticizing these people who have lost any sense of the beauty of the Gujarati language mm -hmm. and they're chasing the English language. And he uses some beautiful metaphors now, which I can't remember off the top of my head, to talk about why that's such a terrible thing. So, yeah. Yeah. First off, congratulations. <laughs> I'm trying to read the book. Thanks. Growing up in Bombay, we all, you know, it was this rich tradition of Gujarati literary cultures flourishing in different art forms. Mm -hmm. The whole Natak yes. subculture, where you went for a play every Sunday. Yeah. Uh, you had magazines, yes. which everybody read. Chitra Lekha, Chitra Lekha, Chitra Lekha, yeah. all of those <laughs> newspapers, which were often the kind of political. They set the goal yes. for the political sensibility of the Gujarati community. And now I, I, I see these YouTube forwards that I get of people cracking jokes in Gujarati, yeah. and, you know, coming up with these amazing TikTok yes. Yeah. You know. How do you think all of this fits in with this larger tradition? that we see that is enabled by the digital uh, formats. Yeah, you know, it, what's amazing what you just said, I actually follow maybe three or four people um, on Instagram. They're Gujarati influencers. They're young, they're younger than me. Hilarious, okay? They do these videos, these um, reels or whatever. And they're speaking Gujarati and they're talking about Gujarati culture, making fun of Gujarati culture, whatever. They can't read Gujarati. Yeah. It's all spoken Gujarati. Because I reached out to one of them, uh, she, uh, I, I thought, well, you know, because I've been told you should try and get all these influencers to share your book. Very young person with a phone, we're like, yeah. what do you like? Yeah. 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 I, I reached out to them and I said, oh, you know, I, and I didn't know this, so I said, I, I, I can send you the Gujarati text as well, would you mind reading both the, you know, my English translation and Gujarati? She says, I'm happy to read your English, but I can't read the Gujarati. No. Wow. She has like 200 something thousand followers. <laughs> Rich. So, but you know, but I'm glad that they're at least um, perpetuating the language because otherwise the language will just disappear. Um, there are, you know, I, I was reading on this, this one uh, report today, there are 400 plus languages in India, not dialects, they're talking about languages. 30% are endangered, 30%. Um, India, ha India is the fourth most uh, in terms of how many languages, the fourth country in the world with the most number of languages. Mm -hmm. Papua New Guinea is the top, but amazing, because it's much smaller, but they have the most languages. Um, but India is the fourth most populous mm -hmm. in terms of languages. 30% of them are endangered. Yeah. But yeah, I'm glad that they're doing what they're doing, uh, though, but I just wish they could read the language too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there, would you say there's a difference between a language when it, I mean, even like spoken versus written. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like length, they like move in different forms. Like it's almost different things when you pin it down versus. Yeah, I mean, like if this was transcribed, it'd be very different. I'm sure if we we're writing to each other. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, yes. I mean, I think the uh, there was a point in time when, for example, Dungedu, his Gujarati was. Well, there were two kinds of Gujaratis when he was writing. There was the very colloquial kind. And there was the highly Sanskritized point. One of the reasons that I say this in my, in my introduction that he was very different from the writers of his time, he went with the colloquial. He veered away, he was, because the people who were writing in the Sanskritized form, they were writing about well to do, higher society, which are the lifestyles and stories. And he went and started to write about rural India. And so he did the colloquial. So his writing isn't as Sanskritized. And, and actually, the funny thing is, it's harder for me. Because mm. I didn't grow up with those kind of criticisms. Mm. And so I have to, sometimes I have to go and do this whole etymology search. Like, what does this sentence mean, even, you know, all this 
uh, idiom. Yeah. Uh, so, but ye were colloquial. But to your point, there, there, there was a point in time when almost all of Gujarati literature, or at least the one, the, the Gujarati literature that was lauded and, and, and held up as this is the canon, was Sanskritized Gujarati. Um, today, the writers who are writing now, and I'm translating one, uh, they, it's more like the everyday Gujarati that I speak. You know? And so for me, it's very easy to translate her work um, because it just flows for me. This was very hard compared to that. Uh, even though hers is a 600 page novel, but it's easier. But yeah, so I think now it's more conversational, yeah. but it used to be highly sensitized. Yeah. So fascinating. Wow. One more question. Sorry. Sorry. So this year's Booker Prize was won by an Indian author who yes. originally wrote in Hindi. Yes. The book was translated. The first time ever a translated Salvation. book from Hindi has won the book. And what were your thoughts on that? Oh, yeah, I know Daisy, the translator, very well. Um, so Daisy Rockwell. And I, I mean, first, I was very, I was thrilled. Every, I, I don't know who, who, you know, any South Asian person who was not thrilled that the first time ever a book translated from a South Asian language won the Booker Prize. Mm -hmm. What I was not so thrilled about was, you know, the usual when uh, people, you know, the news media started talking about it as if it's the first ever book written in Hindi. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know we, we, we write, we've had literature in India since before colonial times and people have been writing books for a long, long, long time. It's just that it took so long for the West to recognize it. And Daisy's journey was interesting, the translator. She, uh, she has all, she's a veteran translator. She's published a bunch of Hindi Urdu books from, uh, you know, she studied under A.K. Ramanujan at the University of Chicago. Uh, she's not Indian, but she's immersed herself in the language and learned the language. Um, she's translated several books. This was the first one that she chose not to have published in India, but she went with Tilted Access Press in the UK, yeah. who's very similar to Tim Fallon, right? Mm -hmm. um, with Deborah Smith. And um, Tilted, and, and the reason she did that, she wanted the Booker, right? Because she was like, you, because the Booker, you know, has certain conditions. With the Booker Prize, not, you know, no, it's not that anybody can just enter. You have to have been published in the UK. You have to have the publisher has to have had a track record in terms of you know, the distribution. There are eligibility criteria. Anyways, so she chose Tilted Axis. Luckily for her, Tilted Axis wanted to take this book on because it's a daunting book. It is 600 plus pages, and um, all, all you know, kudos to Deborah Smith for taking it on uh, during the pandemic. Um, and uh, I, I think, again, it's written by a contemporary living author, because that's the other stipulation Booker has, um, is that the, the original author must be living. Um, but I, I was thrilled to see it. Uh, I think, you know, what's interesting, um, so the publicist at Tilted Access Press, because I run this uh, global online forum called Daisy Books uh, for South Asian Literature. The publicist at the time, Sanal Goyal at, at, at Tilted Access, reached out to me last year when Tomb of Sand came out, because it was getting no attention mm. in the UK press. Mm. Guardian didn't do a review, nobody did a review, even though it was Tilted Access Press. They reached out to me and said, could you do something? So I said, okay. And Daisy was not feeling well, so Daisy didn't want to do an interview. So I said, Daisy, why don't you do a reading? You read the English version, have Gitanjali read the Hindi, and I'll put it together as a podcast episode, which I did. Well, and so I was one of the first to even put something out there in terms of publicity, media publicity. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, when the book of work, the views for that, <laughs> just <laughs> like the, the listens and views for that episode just went, like it's my most popular episode now. <laughs> so, um, but the other good thing I thought that, I, uh, that I've been hearing from Daisy uh, is that because of the book of win, there are people who have gone and picked up the original Hindi book in India, but those who can read it, they've gone and picked up the original Hindi with the translation. So the translation and the win has driven people who can read the language to go and read the original. And I think that's amazing. Mm -hmm. There are people who have said, who I have seen this, they've been tweeting at Daisy and, I, and Daisy like retweets it. Um, they've been saying to her, I haven't read Hindi since high school, but your book of win made me go back and read it. Wow. 
which so that's great, right? Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm all for that. If, if someone were to say to me, oh, and, and actually I had one person say this to me. She said she read my book, and then she wanted to read the original in Gujarati, because she is Gujarati. Okay. She started reading it and doing FaceTime with her grandfather every oh. evening and reading to him. Oh. So she came and told me that on Instagram. I was like, oh well, say hi to your grandfather. <laughs> Now you said that uh, you have a background in engineering. Yes. So what drove you to write your first book? What? So I have been, I had wanted to be a writer from a very young age. When I was in India, um, Femina India is a magazine which, when I was 10 years old, it was a very different magazine than it is now. I have yes. to say, okay, <laughs> we did not have what they have now. But, <laughs> but um, I sound like a prude, I'm not. I mean, I do read Feminine now, even when I see it around. But um, back then, it was a very serious feminist magazine. And my English teacher saw them advertising or asked a children's writing competition. And she came to me, I was 10 years old. She came, she said, it's fifth grade. You must write a story for this. And I was like, oh, yes. And I wrote a story that was pretty much a ripoff of H.G. Wells. It was called Robots Who Wrote Poetry. <laughs> it was speculative fiction, and it literally it had a robot who wrote poetry. And then I, I still want a copy of that story. I keep trying to ask people, can you connect me with somebody in the Femina archives? Because I'd love to get my story. Um, but what happened was I won 75 rupees, eventually some in those days. Um, the check went to my parents. In the summer holidays when I went home, nobody talked about it. <laughs> nobody wanted to talk about me winning a short story competition. Years later, my mom told me it was because they didn't want me to get ideas about becoming a writer. <laughs> <laughs> because, as you probably know, writing was not a respectable profession for conservative for young majority women. So it, for me, there were only two choices, was engineering or medical. And since I fainted at the sight of blood, that was out. So uh, engineering was what I had to do. But I always had the writing thing in, in the back of my mind. And when I moved to the US, and after I paid off my UK student loan, which took me three years, um, I started to use my vacation time and weekends to go and take writing workshops in the US. And um, I remember that at, the, at Western Michigan University, that was the first one I attended. It was, they called it the Third Coast Writers Conference. And I, I took a writing workshop there, and that was my first. And the instructor said, she thought my writing had promise, and that's all I needed to hear. <laughs> so <laughs> after that, I, I went to um, University of Iowa. I used to do, and they still do, I think, the summer writing festival, where you could just go and like live there for three weeks at a time and just take workshop after workshop. And so I used to do that in the summer. Um, so, yeah. so is there anything, uh, any do's and don'ts for people who want to take, want to just try out writing, maybe? I think, I mean, no, I mean, I don't think there's any do's and don'ts. I think take some workshops for sure, because it helps you learn the craft. I teach at Writing Workshop Dallas on my classes, but so, so certainly learn the craft. Um, but I would also say, being the age that I am, don't give up your day job. Writing does not make a lot of money at all. I saved up money. I came to writing in my 40s. I didn't give up my day job. I saved the money. I, I even moved back to India for a few years because cost of living is best there. So I, I, I'm practical. I will tell people don't give up your day job. <laughs> you know, Try and do it on the side if you can. Um, or save up enough money so that you can. But, but certainly take right. I, I'm all for taking workshops and learning the craft. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what do you get out of the creative yeah, you know, for me, it's write, writing began for me. I feel weird talking about this because I thought he's a better writer and he's sitting in the audience here. Um, he is a good writer. You guys should all read his work too. Um, but um, for me, it's a way of processing the world. Every single story I wrote in each of us pillars started with a question for me. And it was writing it as a fiction story mm -hmm. was a way for me to understand and process what was happening because 
I have to tell you, I have been gone from India for such a long time, and then going back in 2014, when the whole country was up in weird, crazy, you know, uh, it, anyways. So it's a way of processing. I mean, translation is different. Translation is um, a way of close routine or whatever, but uh, writing is just a way of processing the world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do you ever get any writer's block and challenges? And tell us a little bit about you um, <laughs> that we don't know. Well, I, yeah, you know, people, people tell you I've been trying to write this novel for two years now and I keep rewriting it. It's like you're not finishing it, you keep rewriting it. I keep rewriting the same 40,000 words. Um, so, <laughs> I, but I think I'll get there eventually. So he knows that I, I, it's, I, don't, I don't think it's writer's block. Mm -hmm. I think when you hit a wall with writing something, it's a sign that you need to do a bit more research or you need to step back from it for a while. And so that, I have, because sometimes you're so close to it, you can't see the forest for the trees. Um, and for example, with this novel that I've been trying to write, I stepped back from it for a few months. I worked on translation, came back to it, changed the point of view of the main character, and suddenly it started to flow again. You know, you know? And so I think, um, I think writer's block is really just a sign telling you, pay attention, do something different. Any favorite Indian authors besides Chumpala, really? Well, you know what? She's not my top. I, mean, okay. I have to say, she writes about her, well, at least her fiction before Italian uh, translation. She wrote about a very specific milieu of a yeah. very like educated Bengali mm -hmm. immigrant, and that's not me. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not. I love her craft, mm -hmm. but uh, she's not necessarily my top most Indian author. I mean, you know, this is going to sound like cliche, so I'm not wishy. <laughs> I just, well. so far, recently, Midnight's Children, so so here's the thing, when you grow up in Bombay, you grow up mm -hmm. speaking a, what we call a Chutneyfied English, <laughs> so it's like, or, or English, right? yeah. it's like half, in, half English and half English, you grow up speaking that, right? You you grow up reading it in Film Fair magazine or Cine Blitz mm -hmm. magazine, which is what we did, but to see it as literary fiction in a book, to see that language, to see my Bombay in a book, and then to see that book winning the booker, not once, not twice, but three times, that is validation. Mm -hmm. That told me, oh, yeah, I could write about my Bombay. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, he's still, he's still the man. Yeah. <laughs> OK. OK, I'm going to let them all like yes. individually <laughs> ask you questions, basically. <laughs> and I'm assuming you're very willing to sign books. Oh, yes, yeah. Please, very um, willing to yes, so There's so much food, so oh my yeah, gosh. Please help yourself. Yeah. There's a lot of food. <laughs> we have so much food. We have so many books. Yes. <laughs> so many so so books, books cost money, but like really. Yeah. Well, let's have a round of applause, first of all. Woo!